The word why, what a curious word. The kind of word that can make us cringe, feel defensive, or even distant. But you know, sometimes why is the key. The key that can unlock so much to our lives. Join me as we explore the why with fascinating contributors to the world. Those that entertain us, inform us, teach us about life, and if we're lucky, inspire the next in all of us. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and welcome to Headroom, a production of Rainlight and co-produced by Old Soul. Let's go. Uh, well, I'm going to have to hide my uh, enthusiasm. In fact, my wife last night said, okay, honey, I get it. You're incredibly excited about this upcoming interview. And I know that archaeology and the study of archaeology was your absolute favorite course at Michigan State years ago. Not my discipline, but it was absolutely my favorite. Uh, this is an incredible treat and one that came just going through a, down a rabbit hole. Uh, I'm a big documentary film fan, and there's a series on Netflix called Unknown. And I had seen, I think it's Killer Robots and The Lost Pyramid. And lo and behold, there's a new Netflix, relatively new, just in the last couple of weeks here, if not 10 days, um, unknown series called Cave of Bones. And the, really the main character in this, I mean, the, the individual that you're following along in this, this journey is a Dr. Lee Berger spelled the exact same way. And I thought, you know what? <laughs> Let me take a flyer, shoot Lee a note, and uh, lo and behold, he went by Rod, my name, when he was a, a, a young person many moons ago in that regard. And I thought, okay, this is, we've got to have a conversation here. So uh, let me give you the formal introduction. Uh, Dr. Lee Berger is an award-winning paleoanthropologist whose explorations into human origins on the African continent, Asia, and Micronesia for the past three decades have resulted in many new discoveries, including the discovery of two new species of early human relatives, which we will get to in our discussion today. These discoveries were recognized by the Smithsonian as among the 10 most important scientific discoveries of the decade in 2020. A current National Geographic Explorer in Residence, Berger won the first National Geographic Society Research and Exploration Prize in 97. He was also named the Rolex National Geographic Explorer of the Year in 2016, and two years later became an explorer at large. In 2016, he was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the World, He's also served in a number of advisory roles, including the Global Young Academy, the Jane Goodall Institute, South Africa, and has chaired the Fulbright Commission. As an explorer in residence, Berger leads National Geographic's Rising Star Project, named for the CAVE system and fossil site in Southern Africa, where he conducts his research. Teams under his leadership have recovered more individual hominid remains in sub-equatorial Africa over the last decade than were recovered in the previous 90 years. In 2015, PBS Nova National Geographic documentary Dawn of Humanity about Berger's discovery of Homo Naledi and the Rising Star Expedition was nominated for an Emmy. What a treat, uh, Lee, to spend time with you. It's, you know, I, I have these experiences where I watch somebody on TV or on screen and then I'm spending time with them. And it, it's just a very surreal kind of experience. I want to start with this. From, from a guy who grew up in small town Kansas, I want to understand. I was born in Kansas, but I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to understand the choice of a profession where success can be fleeting, success can be a moving target, success can be something where we don't measure maybe by traditional means and or are scrutinized at every pass, especially if you're not the one that has maybe made the discovery or led a group to the path of a discovery. Talk about that in with the backdrop of one's own self-esteem, understanding sort of your own constitution about what makes you tick and what really matters in the process of discovery. That's a, that's a great question. And I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is why is success, other people's version of success, a measure of that? I don't, I don't look at myself that way. I chase what I love, what my, my, what, what I enjoy, what my, uh, gut instinct tells me um, I I never stop exploring. Uh, you know, I, my life has always been about what's the next thing we can find, knowing there's more out there. And you know, if if if, if the externalization of success by others is that's not my goal. It, it is it's really this passion that there's there there's things we don't know as humans that that I can play a small part in in revealing that make us a better species and 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 you know and make an impact forever and and that for me is just what drives me it's 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 the it's this adventure it's the fun of it and it's it, it's the wonder i you know 
I, my real goal is I hope I never lose the childlike wonder for discovery. I am so glad you brought that up there because in watching the documentary twice, there was this arc in the experience for me as an audience member, this arc of experience in watching you and the emotion that you felt through the journey. And I'm going to let you sort of, we talked about this off air, sort of pick and choose what you want to share. So that in essence, we don't give everything away from the sure. documentary that I absolutely encourage people to check out. And it's from his book, Cave of Bones. So I, I encourage you to go grab the that book. That goes a lot deeper into the sort deeper, of the yeah. feeling. And, and, and you know, because obviously a film is, that was a remarkable experience doing the film. Uh, it was one that I've never done before. You know, every, I've done lots of documentaries of my career and they're always scripted in a way we've made a discovery and someone's coming along and saying okay let's now talk about the discovery and implications this wasn't done like that at all that that crew showed up and was with us and that's scary as a scientist i'll tell you that because you know what you're seeing in the show is that journey um we didn't know any of this was going to happen uh, we this this started as kind of they came to us and said, oh, you're going to be one of a four part series. And we're you know doing these sort of new experiment in 90 minute nonfiction movies that are going to be sort of our entry into that. And and we look, I looked at it and it looked really intriguing and it was going to be a retrospective on, you know, what we found over the last five or six years with Homo Naledi. which, you know, that's great and interesting. I mean, I, I think it would have been a compelling thing, but. Then they did that Netflix thing where they showed up and they hung teams with us and and they didn't go away and they would join us. And as things happen, almost everything, you'll see a, a scene where, you know, we I, I make fire and I'm showing how I think the caves lit. That's all spontaneous. That wasn't happening because there's a movie crew here. That was happening because we were having beers the night before. And Augustine Fuentes says, they must have used fat candles to move through there. And I said, you don't need to do that, man. You just need a couple of kids and some fire and you can walk your way into the deepest thing. That's what I was demonstrating. So that stuff is real. There's actually nothing scripted in the entire in the entire show. And I think that that's that's kind of cool. It's it, it's scary to do at the time because you don't know what you know, you never know how that's going to look when you're happening. And that includes, you know, my journey in it, and then the discovery of those symbols and, 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 and the, the emotion you see when we discover that this is almost certainly a tool in the hand of this dead Maletti child in a grave. And you watch the other scientists and I can hardly speak in that moment, you know, as, as I'm seeing these images done by the most powerful and advanced machines on the planet to image this. And I, it just, it was a lot of fun. It was an emotional roller coaster and still is. And that's the beauty, you know, science can be a hell of a lot of fun. And it does come through uh, in the relationships. So uh, speaking of the arc of emotion, I wonder how it's impacted the questions that you ask, because look at the base of it and I'll give pre So I grew up in the North, went to Michigan state. I live in the South now. And I remember when I first moved down here in the late nineties, I had experiences there were conversations where people offhandedly would say, well, that course, you couldn't take that anthropology course in a, in a Southern university or it would be very different because we're talking about religion. We're talking about science and we're talking about sort of two entities that classically seem to butt heads uh, or at least that's what, you know, the fodder is. But yet when I'm watching you in the film, I can see you wrestling with it, but in a very open-minded way that says you're, you're experiencing everything, you, you're open-minded to it. And it does feel kind of like you're having, I don't, you, you describe the experience because it seems like it's changed you. And I think you even said that in the film, that it had changed you when you finally went down the chute and what a compelling element of, of the movie and the story to be able to go down. And, and it's, it's cringeworthy in that I couldn't do it. I don't think most people could go down where you went uh, physically. Um, but talk a little bit about how it's changed you. And it's open maybe your mind to different types of questions as you continue to explore. So firstly, I just want to go back. I took every one of my anthropology courses in Southern universities, and they are better than the ones I've, I've taken and teach in, in <laughs> Northern <laughs> universities. So I'm just going to do a shout out for that. And I, and, and we can go back to the, uh, is religion in conflict with this? I don't think it is. And I, I spend a lot of time uh, going to audiences and places deliberately that a lot of colleagues don't, because I, I think that that's, we have to involve everyone. This is 
our story as a species. And so I'm I'm quite passionate about uh, uh, about that. But getting to getting to that, um, you know, I have lived my life as a scientist, and so we put up barriers to uh, um, externalizing emotion our small trusted clusters. Um, there's a very wrong and, and bad part of the scientific community that says that, you know, we don't, we're not human. We have to assess things as robots and we have to, uh, everything is objective. Well, there's no such thing as that. Anyone knows that, you know, your observation alters what you're looking at. Anyone from a hard physicist to the, to the, to, to the softest of sciences. And, and so, you know, one of the things that, that, has changed within me over this, and this is all very recently, is my perception that of of uh, culture, the way that we formulate null hypotheses in paleoanthropology, I think it's been dreadful, and I think it's caused a great deal of harm. And this has all changed because of these discoveries, the idea that we have approached, we for some reason animalized uh, our ancient human relatives. We created the null hypothesis that everything we observe in the past around hominins, our, us and our relatives, uh, must be of natural causes. Um, and that's despite the last 20 plus years of science, uh, behavioral sciences that tell us that so many animals have complex cultures. Gorillas certainly have it. Chimpanzees have it. Cetaceans have it. Corvids have it. Um, and and on and on and on. You know, across across the, these cultures are complex. They are real and they're observable and they're testable. And yet, for some reason, we as a field look back at at human past and humans contemporary humans into the relatively recent past of the last 100,000 years or so are somehow exceptional. And everything has to be observed in the past as a natural occurrence. You have to prove that this accumulation of hominids has, natu has not naturally occurred before you can invoke culture. And one of the things that has foundationally changed in me after being in those spaces, seeing these engravings, seen the uh, inter hypothesizing graves dug into the ground, a tool-shaped rock in the hand of a child, and all the things, and other things which we'll be announcing, you know, that because this is a process um, that would come from the molecular evidence in other areas, tells me, I think we screwed this up. I think we should have approached hominin evolution as the null hypothesis is that whatever we're looking at is cultural, and I think that's testable, and uh, more so than everything we look at is of natural origins. And what I mean by that for people who are getting subtleties, when we look at a dead body or a dead part of a hominin, we're always looking for what killed it, how did it get there, um, why is it there? And the reasons we do that is, is part of reconstructing the lives of hominins and their, their environments. However, the last 60 years or so of the science has said, well, we need to find out what carnivore killed them. We need to find out how they fluvially got there in the geology of the site. And, in, and, and if we don't find that, we continually add natural causes, but natural causes are nearly infinite. And as you know, if you don't have a refutable hypothesis, it's not actually a scientific question. And whereas if we had gone earlier in this field and said, the way the field started, I actually think, and said, these are cultural animals. They are undeniably so. The, 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 there is probably never been a hominin. It's not cultural. We have tools that go back 3.3 million years, and we're going to keep finding them older than that. Then you can actually refute whether the situation you find is a is is a not a cultural event. And so, you know, I have switched the way that that we are exploring these spaces because they are cultural spaces. They is the are scientific community prepared to. I guess pivot because I mean when we're talking about Homo naledi and the brain size, the disparity between their brain size and our brain size, and yet you and your team uncovered cultural practices that are absolutely mind blowing that make you think existentially about the way in which they thought about not just this lifetime but potentially a next lifetime. That has to create a a a fork in the road for the scientific community and the way in which they question the very 
elements that they are searching for. Is that fair? No, that's right. That's right. And I mean, that's what I'm touching on, I suppose, is the idea, the way we search, the way we ask questions, the way we 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 postulate or formulate hypotheses. Um, are they ready? Well, you know, I would remind, and you know, media is a terrible thing because always if you read the New York Times or whatever, it's Lee Berger says, people forget that this is one of the largest science projects in the world. There are over 160 scientists plus, and I'm being really conservative when I say this, engaged in this, this project. And so, you know, in a field, the scale of paleoanthropology and its broader disciplines that attach to it, um, we're not an insignificant voice in that field of active publishing working scientists. And I'm very proud of that, by the way, in, in, in that this is a large multidisciplinary uh, project. Is the, field re is the rest of the field ready to pitch? You know, I actually think you'll be surprised. I think there will be a large vocal criticism. There is a large vocal criticism of this, but that large is of a couple of dozen individuals. And they are very vocal because they vested in themselves in the idea of human exceptionalism. They study modern human origins. They study burials that for the last 50 years in large brain things like Neanderthals, which they've never been able to settle. And we just drop in and go, oh, this tiny brain thing actually did it. And we have better evidence. You know, we have more evidence and 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 that creates problems, as you would imagine, in, in a field of of, of archaeology and, and paleontology. Everyone wants to raise the level. They start saying, well, this is an exceptional claim and it requires exceptional evidence. My response to that is we met and exceeded yours. And and that's not being arrogant. What that's saying is, you know, was yours not exceptional? You know, when you were claiming the oldest burial in Africa or the oldest this or the oldest that. And, and you know, science is a, a progress. And often people don't understand that, you know, hypothesis testing. Science isn't about reaching some singularity of truth. It's about formulating a hypothesis, an idea that is testable. We do so. We either refute it or we alter that hypothesis and we move on forever. Because evidence is not a finite thing, and it's not a, a thing, and particularly in a field like this, which is in its infancy. Um, and and so, you know, so the, this long-winded answer to your question is, I think much of the field is ready, has been expecting this with studies of animal cultures and animal behaviors and recognizing that. I think there is an entrenched part of this field that I don't care what you found they would accept they would accept this because it's challenging you know 50 years of 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 dogma explain i know you coined the term underground astronauts <laughs> i just think is it's like for every high school or middle school student out there underground astronaut go like as a prop go write a star <laughs> oh man it's so visual but it's like you don't think about it until you sometimes you hear something so simple and you say I, I get it, at least in the way in which I can get it by watching something or hearing somebody communicate that. Can you speak to that? Because something, it, there's something so powerful, I think, in the world that you occupy and the 160 plus it, scientist, which is a level of comfort with ambiguity, a continuous celebration of the human experience of surprise. Absolutely. Headroom is produced by Old Soul, a one-stop marketing agency that understands the power of brand and nuance. Reach out to my guy, Matt, at Old Soul and supercharge your brand and content strategy. That's Old Soul. Shoot Matt a note at aoldsoul.com. That's A-O-L-D-S-O-U-L.com. And now back to our guest. So I, I, you would, I, I'm glad you like that term. I have had so much hate mail over the years for that term. Really? <laughs> oh yeah. The moment it was uttered, and I'll tell that story because it's relevant to it in a moment, but the moment it was uttered, I, I immediately got, they're not astronauts. They're pteranauts. They're troglonauts. It's underground. You can't say that. Astro means, you know, but I say, well, but it's the exploration of deep space, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but Having said that, the the way that uh, that that term was coined was in the enthusiasm of the moment in the 2013 expedition at Rising Star, where I had allowed 
uh, social media in our doors. I encouraged it. We had almost a million followers over by the end of that expedition. I wanted to let the world enjoy what might be the first and last time in history that you could watch an actual ancient hominin being discovered. And um, it was high risk. We didn't know, you know, you can have failure. I was putting people's lives at risk of scary stuff. And as we went through that first re- week, it was about by the end of the first week when we realized that something exceptional was happening, that we were likely recovering what might be the largest assemblage of hominins ever discovered in all of history. And the emotions were very there. And you got to remember, I'd set up a command center. I'd modeled it on two things. The deep sea exploration of my friends, Bob Ballard and James Cameron, where you have a command center and remote operated vehicles. In this case, my remote operated vehicles were people and NASA, which I've been a big fan of since I was a child. And their command centers with all their engineers and scientists who will never get into the spaces that they are directing activity in. Exactly what I was in, you know, watching all this camera. And I was I was talking to a National Geographic um uh, a website guy, and he was interviewing me. And and I was talking about these images that were set up because of the type of security cameras I used. I just adapted commercial security cameras. And so they were infrared half the time. And if there wasn't light, they were this ghostly images that look just like those things you see from the late 60s and early 70s of the Apollo missions and, and all of that. And, and I said, you know, he said, what are they like to you? And I said, but they're, they're, they're like astronauts, but they're underground astronauts. And it stuck. And then the hate mail started. It's just um, because it paints such a picture to me in, mm. in that manner to think about places that we have not yet thought about, been able to explore. Oh, I agree. I, I, I use the term. I never let it go because it does do that. You know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. <laughs> do you find that you're at this point in your career? Uh, talk about the role of responsibility. Talk about the things that as you close down on a given night and you lay your head down on a pillow that basically sort of bookend your day when you think about your role in this space, because you are you are different. I find it to be very appealing this way because you are public and sharing the story. And I think that that's been in many disciplines throughout research, that's been sort of the criticism, which is Let's find a way to share this with the public. Let's invite uh, exploration, curiosity, so that young people want to join the fields, ask maybe bigger, different, better questions, uh, challenge us. And I think you do a really nice job of that. And I'm wondering if you've gone from, has there been a transition in the activity and the way in which you think in representing the field and or the responsibility for the scientists that are supporting and wanting to work with you? Because you could get that sense too. There was a, but also you seem incredibly humble where You're comfortable, but it's not a comfortable space for you because it's not about you. Hmm. So first, thank you for that. Um, And and I appreciate that greatly. I mean, the, you know, I have always had a problem that that science and particularly my science, interestingly, because it was a science of scarce resources had had become um, closed. It had taken up the sort of Cold War behavior of secrets because it wanted to act and play like a hard hard science, which had secrets and stuff, the peer review system, which only emerged, and people don't know this, in the early 1970s and didn't hit our field probably to late 80s, or early 90s, you know, but has some magical connotation, actually it turned into a gatekeeping sort of exercise of what sh- what's good science and bad science, what should be published and what shouldn't. That was not the intent of it and shouldn't be the intent of it. But that creates all this hostility and animosity. And then the neoliberalism of universities where, you know, they wanted to measure people so they couldn't give them tenure. So they tell them you have to only publish peer review papers and that, which creates all of that has just created, I think, some terrible behaviors in science. And some of that leads to uh, poor communication skills and the lack of communication of, of, of science that we and we've not taught scientists that it's part of their responsibility. You know, the terrible way in which, you know, all of the last several years have highlighted how badly scientists communicate and climate scientists as well, going further back than that, show us how important science communication is. But, you know, going to your question and, and talking about what I think about when I go to bed at night and what I want to leave as a legacy. When I got into this field, um, 
I, I rose very quickly. I was in Africa. I rose and was given enormous power as as the as, as a very early young uh, scientist in charge of fossils that I had access to. I found a boys' club um, that was, you know, that it was an old boys' club with school ties and all that said, you know, if you're not a member of this club, you don't get access. And I had come from a non-traditional background, rural Georgia, you know, to universities that didn't begin with H and Y and P and that kind of thing. And and was um, I, I didn't like it. It didn't feel right. It didn't feel scientific. I didn't understand how you could have a science where everyone couldn't see the data. You know, you just had to believe. And that's not science. And so I began to rebel against that. And that was my early entry into open access and uh, and, you know, and as we moved into the early 20th, uh, 21st century, the ideas I got involved with Wikipedia, some people know. And then because I knew and Larry Sanger, the co-founder, knew it wasn't going to work. We founded Citizendium. You know, that tells you about my foresight and judgment <laughs> and uh, as a breakaway organization because we, we knew it was going to fail. And we, and 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 constantly started trying to break that barrier down. And I, I very... I'm very much aware that two legacies that that I hope I leave to this field, despite the trolling and stuff that happens and, and you know, the the natural instinct of some scientists say that's not the way it's done. You're not you're not conforming to what it is. I want to leave an accessible science. I want to leave in this particular field the idea that that when we find things, they belong to everybody. They should not, there should not be gatekeepers. We're trying to answer bigger questions. And it's as stupid to hide hominid fossils and other cultural artifacts and things you see as it is to 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 try to hide, you know, a number. You know, it's like I own number seven, and so therefore you can't use it in equations. That's stupid. You couldn't do anything if that, and, and I say you can't do anything if we we hide these fossils. So I want to leave that. I want to change that access, and I do that by giving it away. That's why I keep finding things, because I was a fan of Tolkien, and I was a kid reading Tolkien in Sylvania, Georgia, and it was so funny. I played Dungeons and Dragons and stuff like a lot of kids of that era did, and I remember that uh, talking with my friends, and we had a very different take when reading that book. They read it and they talked about fellowships and battles and together like that. And I'd read it and I heard something very different from him. I heard that, you know, if something ever begins to possess you and feels like it owns you and it becomes so important that you lose yourself in it and it begins to look like this kind of golden ring, you should take that sucker off and do everything in your power to find the nearest volcano and throw it into, because there are plenty of golden rings. And that's how I view the data, which are the fossils and the discoveries in this. Um, you, you go and find them because you have to share this and they must not be your identity. Your identity is in the next thing you haven't discovered. And you must live that truth. And, and that's, I hope to leave that. And then I want to leave the idea that storytelling is not some thing left to the artists and creatives. It's a foundational part and responsibility of a scientist. Otherwise, they won't believe you and you're actually not acting like a scientist. The Wizard of Oz, the joke of that is that's how most scientists operate. They think you play your organ behind a curtain. And that's why no one believes us. Because we whip the curtain back and we expect them to say, and we go, voila, we science the hell out of this. And they go, yeah, yeah, right. Because they didn't see the process. Let them in. And yet we Let see them in follow. everyday life. We understand as parents that you stair-step things with a young child so that they can start to learn. They can they can expect what's coming. You don't just surprise them with that's right. Right. That's you, right. And they'll and and a child will say, I don't believe leave you if you haven't ste if you haven't stepped them through that rightfully so well we do that as adults too rightfully so so not that i want to i want to box you in at all but i'm curious about what your response would be 
do you consider yourself obviously a paleoanthropologist or a storyteller, an architect, a detective, a boy at heart, an explorer? Like what resonates the most with you? I, I funny enough, I've said that to a couple of people recently. I, I want to live and die as someone who sees the world like a child. That is everything is new. I if you've heard me talk before I talk about things like backyard syndrome and that idea that we often don't look at the spaces we know the best um, because they're not, our brains are wired that way. Otherwise, our heads would explode. We look at areas that are familiar to us and we don't see them at all. That's why you can have a post-it note from five years ago on your refrigerator that you don't actually know is there because that's how the, we, we at new spaces we look over critically. And that's where that misconception about what exploration is. Exploration is the place somewhere someone hasn't been before. That's not true. Exploration is seeing a place and things that other people haven't understood before. That's what exploration is. And, and, and so that's where I go to. I want to keep, and children see the world that way because it's all new to them. Everywhere they go, every space they enter, everything they see is the first time they've seen it. And therefore, and that's why it's full of wonder and full of questions. And so that's why I grab maybe that surprising one. We, what is your relationship with failure or and or getting something wrong? I, I do feel like we're at sort of this nexus in our in our culture where we, we can't use information to make a, a different or a, sort of an evolved uh, observation and assessment. We have to sort of, if we said it in 1985, we're supposed to stick with it today in 2023. Yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you understand that? How do you talk to other students within the field whereby, my goodness, they they put their flag in the ground and they said, I'm going to find X. And it, either they found it and it was different or wasn't what they claimed. How do you handle that part? I'm, I'm curious about the mental health component of this because. This oh, is, yeah, no, it's really important. I think that's hugely important. I mean, you know, because, you know, the first thing is I kind of want to quit about failure. Boy, poster child. <laughs> you know, I've, lived, I've lived a life of that. What's interesting is almost every one of the things that others at the contemporary moment would describe as a failure of my interpretation. Often those have been right. It's just you don't get appreciation for that till you start hearing everyone going. And we always knew that. <laughs> and that's true. That's when you won. <laughs> you know, on the thing. So there is no such thing as failure. Um, failure is a construct of, of others um, about the things that you're doing. Uh, you know, okay, look, you can fail by dying in the process of something, but maybe that's not a failure either, because maybe you teach others a lesson after you're gone, because we all die. So there, there is no failure. Um, I think that we have to become, we don't teach resilience to failure. Science is designed as a process of failure. <laughs> a hypothesis has to be refutable. How alien is that to the way that the general society stares at, at the world? When you, you say, you have to say something that can be proven wrong, i.e., everyone must be trying to prove it wrong. That's a tough world. That's a tough mental place to be. And it's not easy. I would be lying if I said, you know, that when you get the trolls or you get the, you know, even trolls wear white coats. I can promise you that, particularly when given, you yes, know, keyboards, <laughs> keyboards and access to social media. And, and you know, what you, they, it almost creates a, often scientists are taught. I remember hearing scientists tell other scientists when I was a graduate student such that you must never write a bad paper. And even at that time, I was like, what does that mean? Yeah, what what they that? meant is you can never be wrong. Everything, well, everything they ever wrote, every one of those individuals is wrong now. As history. I mean, to try and do that is what you, you know, that's not the way you advance and innovate. That's the way you conform to mediocrity. And, and so, you know, we need to build generations and not just science, but life that are attuned to failure is the normal process. It's the best of the human experience. And that innovators, you know, you hear this in every trope about, oh, I succeed in business. I never hire anyone who hasn't failed. It's more than that. It's, it, it, it must be an integral part of the way you, you approach questions. It, there's a bit of fearlessness in that. It's not 
easy to teach everyone uh, to do that, particularly people who choose to go in science. Often people who choose to go in science have certain parts of them that are introverted or or they're, they're seeing that space as a protected space. And I think that's a problem, too, because we often are pushing extroverts and creatives away from the sciences, acting like it belongs to people who are dysfunctional. It doesn't have to. It shouldn't. We need to offer that to the people who can change things and dare to do things that others won't do. Why do we celebrate that in business and the societies of the world and that? And, and we, we, we attack it even amongst ourselves as scientists. I don't know. I don't have an answer to it, but I don't like it. And I think I, I were, that was the, the last part of what I would say when I go to sleep at night. I want to change that. I want to bring Homo Naledi into this, but I want to give this as a, a preamble here and just kind of walk down this path with me, if you will. We're not going down the chute. <laughs> so nothing, you don't You're have good. to work out. I'm not going way. again. <laughs> um, this, this human need, this human need to put a bow on things, whether it's to have a happy ending in a movie or a conclusion in a book or a conclusion to a relationship or a job or a project. And I'm I'm wondering where we where you just hypothesize this has either originated or come from or evolved over time. With now, if we incorporate in Homo naledi, or at least, you know, uh, the genus Homo, which is to say, when we watch that, and for those that have read the book, there had it looked as if there was a there was an understanding of life cycle. There was an understanding mm -hmm. of community and culture. There was an understanding and or a, a thought about what if we're not here, which is, I, that's a question I have for you. Maybe it's off air about the symbols that you discovered once you were there in the chamber mm -hmm. and the tool, right? To find a child holding a tool and yet we made marks and it's like, is this a path out at some point? Like, is this a way for me to say, Lee, if you... <laughs> If we ever meet again, I've given you sort of a, a roadmap back. But to me, it speaks to this notion of wanting to provide a conclusion, an ending point to things. Where do you hypothesize this started that we wanted to, We closure is so important to us. And is it only been exclusive to Homo sapiens or can we open this up now a bit to the genus Homo? It's funny you use that word, um, closure, because I almost... Aren't you really describing exactly the opposite of that? The idea that that when you place a tool in the hand of the dead, you're expecting them to use it. You're not putting it there for you. That's a different type of closure. You're putting it there for them. Um, and and you know, I think that part of this is this deep contemplation that we thought until this moment in history, by the way, and that's why this is a big deal, that that was exclusive to us. This concept that I am going to die. It's the one certain thing that humans have been blessed with. The consciousness and sentience to understand self-mortality. And the things that that causes us to do, and the the altruism, the you know the the funny statement that we're the most violent, dangerous, and peaceful animal that's ever lived in the history of this planet, kind of thing, which is all true. Every one of those, you know, that because one's the application of things, and the other is the the desire and 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 way we treat people uh, to other individuals who do that. Um, and I I don't think it's about closure. I think it's about eternity. It's about a recognition of, 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 of continuum. Because I think that tied into that is a recognition that your children, you keep mentioning them, and that's interesting because that's your children, offspring, and knowing that they, the reality that they will have children as well, and that this goes on and leaving something for that just as you end. Is that closure or is that continuum? Um, and and I'm fascinated by that. And I don't have, by the way, I don't have a clear answer for you because this is this is the first time in history that humans can truly contemplate another species that's not humans, not our grade level, that doesn't have our brain, that is appears to be, we hypothesize, is carrying a level of culture that's not piecemeal like most animals that we're dealing with in, in, in situation where we're observing culture that's very difficult to identify that seems to be at a whole 
at and in fact exceeding our hypothesized level of ourselves at that same moment. Big deal. What's the moral of the Naledi story? That we have not, that our narrative about ourselves is incorrect. That we have just begun our understanding of the sort of magic of the past, that we as humans are not exceptional. We aren't a series of firsts. We haven't been touched by anything special that hasn't touched other things. And that we need to maybe take a step off that pedestal that we put us because we are screwing this planet up all under the argument that we're entitled to do so. Uh, incredibly powerful. Um, continued success. Uh, what a treat to spend time with you um, and hopefully extract different responses maybe than, you, than you're able to give in, in other conversations that you're having. I, to me, it's about inspiring the next generation and giving hope to the unknown um, and living with and, and, and embracing the underground astronaut because that mentality, I think, is incredible and it's encompassing of so many disciplines. It's collective in nature and it doesn't have an answer, which is fantastic because I don't think we have the answers. Um, I encourage everybody to check out Dr. Lieberger's book, um, Cave of Bones. You can check out the Unknown series on Netflix. It's been ranked in the top five ongoing here for a couple of weeks. So it's incredibly well done. And it does not, I'm so glad you brought that up. It does not feel like one of these scripted, non-scripted docs where every every corner you turn, there's some amazing discovery that just happens to be caught on camera. Uh, it really is about the process and the journey uh, of, of Lee and his colleagues. Uh, what a treat. We're going to continue to follow you. Obviously, you, you look like you were just scratching the surface on your career. There's so much more for you to do, and we are the better for that um, as species that that share that with you here on planet Earth. We want to thank Dr. Lee Berger. I'm your host, <laughs> Dr. Rod Berger. Thanks for taking the plunge into Headroom, where we uncover the why behind the what and who impacting our lives. Headroom is a production of Rainlight and co-produced by our friends at Old Soul. I'm your host, Dr. Rod Berger, and this is Headroom.